Welcome once again to the course Life of Christ. We're still in class 50 on the third part about the Last Supper of Jesus and the disciples. We've used the first two videos to set up some of the background of Jewish customs about the supper. Uh, and in this video, we want to talk about some of the teaching that Jesus did during the Last Supper. So first of all, we go to John chapter 13, and we're not going to read all of that because it, it doubles some of what we already read uh, in Luke and the other Gospels. Uh, but I want to point out several things that John's version says about Jesus and what he taught. For example, in verse 1, it says in the NIV that Jesus loved them until the end. He loved them until the end. And if you look at uh, the phrase there in Greek, it's called eis telos, eis telos. And uh, some versions translate it, uh, he showed them the full extent of his love. That could be another version of the NIV as well. Uh, and so you think, well, what does that mean? Showed him the full extent of his love. What does eis telos mean in Greek? And the interesting thing is that it can mean about three different things. Uh, telos can mean the end, like the end of time. And so he will love them until the end of time. Uh, or telos can mean like the end of a project that you're working on. Or it can mean uh, he loved them until they were perfect, right? Perfect, complete, mature, okay? Uh, and so if you look at all three of those meanings, you see that actually Jesus did all three a stelos, right? He loved them to the end of his life, and then after he resurrected, he's, he's going to love them uh, forever. Uh, he loved them by fulfilling the plan of God for his life on earth and preparing them as his disciples that would go out and spread the gospel. That was his project, and he completed it perfectly. Uh, and then he told them he loved them until they were perfect. Remember Matthew 5:48. We talked about the same word there, be perfect as my heavenly father is perfect. And we mentioned that that actually can be translated as a present imperative, like you be perfect, a command, or the same word in Greek can be translated as a uh, future. You will be perfect. And it's kind of more of a promise there. Uh, and so uh, when it talks about he loves them until they're perfect, Matthew 28 says he'll be with you till the end of the world. Well, then that's when they'll be perfect, when they get to heaven with him. Uh, and so, in a sense, Jesus does all of these, and in particular, the last one, as we live through this life and try to be faithful, then he is, per uh, he is perfecting us in all these different ways. Uh, for example, you can also look at uh, Romans, uh, I'm sorry, Philippians 1.6, where it says, He who began this good work in you will carry it on to completion, telos, in the day of Jesus. Uh, Romans 8, 38 and 39, nothing can separate us from the love of God. He's going to continue loving us uh, until the end in every single way. Uh, another point out of John 13, uh, obviously the, the most striking part of this uh, story is the foot washing that Jesus does. He takes a towel uh, and he washes all the feet of the disciples, usually a task reserved for a servant and usually the lowest servant because it's the most unpleasant task after people have been walking around on the streets. Uh, and yet Jesus takes this towel and he, he serves them. And then he makes a point of it saying, do you understand what I've done for you? Uh, normally the lowest does this, but I who am your king, your leader, your Lord, I've done this for you. And so you should do it for others. And then right in that same context, he says, a new command I give to you to love one another. And it's inescapable that loving in this context means part of what you do is you serve people. It doesn't matter how important you are, uh, you need to humble yourself and serve people. And as he's taught all the way through his ministry, those who humble themselves will be exalted. The last will be first. And so Jesus is a living example of those things, of being humble, putting himself last, and yet being greatly exalted and ended up being first. Uh, Matthew Henry in his commentary says this, uh, some scholars believe the washing of the disciples' feet summarizes the ministry of Jesus. He knew he was equal to God, that everything was his, but he got up from his table of glory, took off his robes of light, took on our nature, came to serve and not be served, shed his blood, and prepared to wash and purify us from our sins. 
And so again, uh, just a, a great point about uh, what Jesus did uh, with the foot washing here. Now, uh, some other questions about the Last Supper and what happened there. We have the story of Judas uh, being fingered by Jesus as the one, and he did it quietly, as we saw in the first video of, of this uh, class. Um, and so some people have asked, well, is that kind of unfair uh, to pick on Judas? Uh, did he have a choice as to not to betray Christ? Uh, was he selected for this from birth? Was it always known that he was going to do this? And so if that's the case, did he have a choice? And isn't that unfair to Judas, right? Uh, another way to ask this would be, was it a plan that God made that Judas could not avoid? And if that's the case, then it doesn't sound very fair, all right? Uh, in this connection, we go back to the story of Exodus, uh, the story of Pharaoh and Moses and the 10 plagues and the same process that repeated itself over and over where Moses would make the demand to let the people go and then the Pharaoh would refuse. He'd harden his heart uh, and then the plague would come and the Pharaoh would repent and say, I'll let you go if you just take this plague away. And then Moses would pray and the plague would be taken away and then the Pharaoh would harden his heart again. This phrase of hardening the heart of the Pharaoh, uh, I think helps us understand uh, if Judas had a choice or not. Because if you look at all the times that phrase was used, about 10 times, I think, in Exodus, um, uh, verse, uh, for example, Exodus 9, 12, and 10, 1, said God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And so again, if God hardens you, you, you can't do anything about it. You can't resist God. And so that's not fair to get punished uh, if God hardens you, all right? But then you have other passages like uh, Exodus 8.15 and Exodus 8.32, where it says that the Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And it's about evenly split, the, the times where it says God did it or Pharaoh did it. So you say, how do you understand this? If the Pharaoh hardened his heart, he deserves his punishment. If Judas chose to betray Jesus, he deserves the punishment, right? Uh, and one example that I've, I've always remembered from a professor named John Willis uh, in a class, he used the example of uh, a jar of, uh, or a tub of butter, uh, and then a recently made clay jar. He said, if you took those two items and you went outside and put them down on a sidewalk on a blisteringly hot 100 degree day, uh, the sun shining full on them, what would happen to the two items? Well, it's obvious that the butter would just melt completely. It'd be a liquid. And then the jar made out of clay would harden under the heat. And so he says that the same sun is shining on both of them. <laughs> the sun doesn't change its nature. The sun is going to shine hot. Uh, but what is the difference is the nature of the two objects. Uh, the clay jar by its nature is designed to harden. And the, the tub of butter, by its nature, is designed to melt. The, the butter is going to melt because that's what butter does under heat. And so my professor suggested that perhaps this is what happened with Pharaoh and what I'm saying happened with Judas as well, that their hearts, by their nature, were not inclined to be obedient, to be responsive to God or to Jesus. Uh, and so as God's influence was felt in them, as Jesus' influence was felt with Judas, then their nature rebelled against that. It wasn't that God or Jesus changed or made them do anything. It was the nature of their hearts that resisted and became hard. That to me makes sense. That, that uh, matches what the Bible says about God and his love and free will and that he's unchanging no matter what. And it also matches what the Bible teaches that we have a choice uh, and if we choose to resist, then there will be certain consequences. And so I think that's probably what happened uh, with Judas and also with Pharaoh, uh, that his nature was not to uh, accept Jesus. And we see little details of it. John says at one point uh, he used to steal from the money bag, right? Uh, he questioned Jesus, uh, the lady's sacrifice, when she spent all the money to anoint Jesus' feet with the nard. Uh, we see him just kind of in general not being a very likable person, and especially, of course, in the betrayal. And yet, then the next question comes up. Okay, so suppose that he hardened his own heart. It was his own choice. Uh, but suppose that instead of running down and hanging himself after he threw the money back in the temple, 
suppose he had stopped and said, okay, what I did was wrong. I repent because it's obvious he repented, right? He felt bad about it. We don't know how far that went. But if he'd have stopped after he threw the coins into the temple and turned around uh, and gone to seek out Jesus, would Jesus have looked at him like he looked at Peter later on? Uh, would Jesus have forgiven him? All right. Uh, and it's an interesting question because you see how Jesus treated Judas all during his ministry. He knew Judas was going to be the guy to betray him, and yet he had him as one of his 12 apostles. He took him everywhere with him for three years, treated him the same way as all the other guys. He washed his feet that very night, right before he was going to go out and betray him. He shared his food with him. He had him in a position of honor, maybe on his left hand, as we, as we mentioned before. Uh, and he loves Judas, even though he knew that he was going to betray him. I believe Jesus would have forgiven Judas, right? And you look at Peter. Peter also betrays Jesus in a way. So Judas and Peter are the same that same night. And we know how Jesus treated Peter, right? He looked at him when he betrayed him that third time, kind of reminded him, I told you this is what you do. But then later on in John 21, we see him taking him back and having him affirm his love for him and then recommissioning him to take a lead in the kingdom. I believe that's how Jesus would have treated Judas if he had repented and not killed himself. So that's a piece of the story we never see, but I think it's one that fits again with the nature of Jesus, that God will forgive us no matter what. If you go on into the rest of the Bible, you see that Romans 5, 6 through 8 says that, while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. <laughs> um, we, we have all these things about the love of God in Romans 8. You know, it, he's the one that can condemn us, and yet he is the one who justifies us. And he loves us no matter what. And so if Jesus loves us in our worst moments, how is he going to reject us? Even if we do terrible things like Peter did, and, and Peter's taken back. I think Judas would have been taken back. And I know that Jesus would take us back. In fact, he doesn't have to take us back. He never lets us go. And so that's just amazing, just underlines uh, the love of Jesus for us. Now going on, if you look at uh, the rest of this section in John, it actually starts in chapter 13 with the, the foot washing and the dinner together. But then 14, 15, and 16 uh, are all discussion probably around the table that night or maybe as they're walking over to the Garden of Gethsemane, and chapter 17 as well. So we have a five-chapter block here in John that has to do with uh, this conversation the last night of Jesus' life before he's crucified. Uh, and really, this whole section in the middle of that, 14 through 16, uh, has to do with knowing Jesus, uh, not just knowing about him, and how the Holy Spirit will be sent and what the Spirit will do in us and through us, how he will transform us to give us life. So let's look just a little bit at some of the details about that. Uh, one of the most famous passages is in uh, chapter 14, verse 6, when he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? Uh, and so, obviously, he's the way. Uh, you know, what does that mean? There's a great example uh, that's in the, the study, Experiencing God, that we've already mentioned once in this course. Uh, there's a story about a pastor that after a service one Sunday morning was invited to lunch at a farmer's house out in the country. And so the farmer gave him directions, and it was the kind of directions that was like, go out of town on this road, and when you get to the big rock, turn right, and when you get to a crooked tree, turn left, and kind of that way instead of names of streets. And so the preacher goes out, and, and he gets totally lost, and he never makes it to the farmer's house. And so the next Sunday, the farmer invites him again, uh, but knowing what happened the previous Sunday, then the farmer just went in the car with the preacher and said, okay, uh, when you get to this road now, turn right. And then they drove for a while, and then the farmer said, okay, now here, turn left. And along with the far along with the preacher, they made it to the farmer's house just fine. And the difference was uh, the farmer was in the car, right? He went along the way with the preacher, and they made it. And I think that's the idea where Jesus is saying, look, I am the way. It's not just that I'm going to give you a book 
like the Bible or just a set of instructions that you have to remember and kind of try to figure out as you go. No, I'm going to send you a spirit, which will be my presence in you. And this spirit will teach you and remind you uh, and, and guard you in every way. He'll intercede for you, do all these great things. Uh, and that's going to be me sitting in your car with you, so to speak, uh, so that you make it to heaven. That's how Jesus is the way, not just by what he did on the cross, but that uh, person that accompanies us all along the way and teaches and instructs us. I think that's more of the idea of the spirit. And so to do that, you have to be close to Jesus all the time. Uh, there's a passage that I love in, in John, 1 John 5. Verse 11, 12 says, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And then listen how simple this is. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. <laughs> it can't get any simpler than that. Uh, if we are with Jesus, then we have life. And, of course, being with Jesus means a lot of different things. It means you try to obey, you try to be faithful, you try to persevere, uh, you repent, uh, all these things. But the idea is you've got to have Jesus. And if you have Jesus, you'll make it. You're okay. You have life and you'll make it to heaven. All right? Uh, and so, again, uh, that's really important. I think if we can grab onto that one idea, we're going to be okay. Okay? Now, uh, some people have gone and given an instruction, uh, kind of an example about this. And I like this, this example. Uh, this guy, uh, Richard Vermbrand, the man we mentioned in the book, Tortured for Christ, right? Uh, he said, sometimes uh, we take Jesus uh, and we build all this scaffolding of truths around Jesus. And the more scaffolding we build, uh, the harder it is to see the original building, <laughs> which is Jesus, and the harder it is to get to it. He says, we do it in a way that we, we try to help each other and learn more about Jesus and the Bible uh, and yet, uh, sometimes it complicates the process. He says, so you start out uh, with Jesus, who we just said is the truth, right? He's the truth, capital T. Then he says, then we add the Bible, which is the truth about the truth. And we need that, right? We need the Bible uh, to instruct us about Jesus. That's our primary source of learning about him at first. Okay, and so uh, the Bible is the truth about the truth. And yet it's one step away in a sense, right? And then we add theology, which is when we try to study the Bible and literally means words about God, okay? We try to, to figure out what God's word says about a lot of different topics, especially Jesus. Uh, and so it's the truth that we're kind of organizing and researching. It's the truth about the truth about the capital T truth. But now you see we're a little bit further away. And then we take that theology and the Bible, and then we add uh, that in classes like this one, or sermons, which are hopefully the truth about the truth about the truth about the capital T, truth, Jesus. So you look how far the scaffolding has taken us away from Jesus, and sometimes we get hung up uh, far out on some of the scaffolding, where we choose to uh, hang on most tightly to a certain teaching or a class or a sermon uh, from a favorite minister or a trusted professor. Uh, and we said, this is it. This is the core right here, this class or this sermon or this doctrine. But you're far away from the core still. You're hanging on to the wrong thing. Now, if it's done right, then the classes and sermons by the teachers or by the, by the ministers can point you then toward Jesus, which they should do. But whenever you stop at the class or sermon, just because it's a favorite guy or, or a favorite teaching, then you're still pretty far away, okay? Or we hang on to a certain theology, okay? But we're still not back to the truth. Or even hang on to the Bible, and the Bible's wonderful. It's the inspired word of God, and we need to know it and study it and memorize it. I mean, we need to have it in our lives. And yet, if we idolize the Bible more than we worship and trust Jesus, then again, we're not at the core. And so all of these things should point us to Jesus so that we end up at Jesus and we know Jesus and we have him in us and we imitate Jesus and become more like him. Uh, that's the core. We need to end up at Jesus. 
a friend of mine gave an example that I really liked. He said, suppose you went into this ritzy, you know, five-star restaurant uh, and you sat down and they gave you this amazing menu. He said, you could, you know, take the menu and see everything that it said. Uh, you could memorize all the list of dishes that that menu, menu has, like the waiters probably did. Uh, you could know exactly what kind of paper that menu has in it and how it's prepared. Uh, you could know who designed the menu and maybe you know him personally and, and what he was thinking when he designed the menu. Uh, you could even understand the languages the menu might be written in if it were like in French or Italian. You could learn those languages and be able to order in those languages. Uh, and then you could know how to order from the menu, which is kind of hard in some of these Ritzy restaurants. Uh, but suppose that you did all that and knew all that, which makes you an amazingly knowledgeable and cultured person. And yet suppose that you never stayed around to eat the food. <laughs> what would be the point then of knowing all that about the menu? And the whole idea is that, you know, if we know all of these things about Jesus, uh, then, or about the Bible and the Greek and the Hebrew and the exegesis and all the ministry tips and tools, uh, but then we never got to Jesus. If we spend our time with all the other things around Jesus, then that would be a waste of time, right? All those things should help us get to the food at the restaurant. All this Greek and Hebrew and exegesis and ministry has to help us get to Jesus and be more like Jesus or else it's a waste of time. So I love that example because I think that sometimes uh, what we do, especially preachers and teachers and scholars of the Bible, uh, it's easy to get lost in the scaffolding instead of getting to Jesus. Then, uh, and also in this section of John, and really all through the Gospel of John, uh, it talks about what the Holy Spirit does, which is the presence of Jesus in us, helping us be more like Jesus and know more about him. You can look up every one of these passages. We're not going to read them all, not time. But 30 times in these 24 verses, at least in the Greek, the Holy Spirit is mentioned. All these different things that he, he does. For example, um, he's described uh, as the counselor. In other words, to give us advice about how to live. Uh, the parakletos, who is uh, the encourager uh, when things go wrong. Uh, he is described as the one who dwells in the believer. He is a teacher. He is a witness to Christ. Uh, he convinces the world of sin and the coming judgment and righteousness. And he is the one who guides the followers of the Lord into all truth. And 1 John even says, you do not need anyone to teach you because you have the spirit who lives in you to teach you. Now, again, we mentioned before, that doesn't mean that teachers or ministers or, or preachers are not necessary. Uh, but the idea is that if you have the Holy Spirit, uh, you have the one who can lead you to the feet of Jesus uh, to be like him. And so, again, really important. Now, Jesus also emphasizes uh, this with one of his other teachings in chapter 15, uh, especially in, in verses 1 and 15. He says, I am divine and you are the branches. OK. Uh, and if you look at uh, Israeli history. Uh, for the Jewish nation, the vine was sometimes used as a type or a symbol of the nation of Israel. Uh, it's in, you know, artwork and things like that, even appears on the coins of Israel. Uh, Jesus talks about how he needs to prune even the good branches uh, so that they can grow more, and then how he cuts off the bad branches entirely, and they dry up and wither, and then they're burned in the fire. Uh, and then through that whole section of John 15, Jesus repeats this idea over and over about remaining or abiding in him, right? Keeping his commands, says uh, the one who remains in me, who abides in me uh, and does these commands will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. OK, so again, it always comes back to the same thing. I'm the way Jesus being with you. Uh, knowing Jesus as the core, not knowing just about Jesus, and then remaining in Jesus, keeping his commands so that we can bear fruit. Now, one interesting detail about this, um, one scholar suggested that if Jesus and his disciples left the Last Supper up in the southwest corner of Jerusalem, uh, in the upper room there, 
and then walked uh, toward the Garden of Gethsemane, they likely walked uh, down the stairs from that part of the city over through the temple. Uh, and many Jews would go into the temple after their Passover supper together, and then they would pray and praise God in the temple that night. And so it's very possible, uh, even likely, that Jesus and his disciples uh, went to the temple, kind of cutting through the temple on their way to the Mount of Olives in the garden, uh, and that they were in uh, the temple. And as I understand it, uh, that hanging in part of the temple was a huge cluster of grapes. It was like a vine with a huge cluster of grapes, and it was made purely out of gold. And that would have been a really impressive sight and a very valuable thing for the Jews. So it's possible that as Jesus is walking with his disciples through the temple and participating in all these ways, talking about these things, that Jesus sees that, and he says, kind of points at that, that cluster of grapes and that vine and says, I am the true vine. Uh, so don't get distracted or overawed by this gold, even though it's valuable. I am the true vine, and you must remain in me to bear fruit. And then he goes on out across the Kidron Valley into the garden. So interesting idea there. And then uh, you have John 17, uh, which is the famous prayer of Jesus. In the first part of the chapter, he says, Lord, you know, I've not lost one of those you've given me except for the one who was going to betray me. Uh, protect them by the power of your name. And then he goes on to pray for them. And on top of what he's already said about loving each other and people will know you by your love, in this chapter, in four times, he emphasizes the importance of being one. May they be one. May the world know that they are in me because they are one. Uh, may may uh, they be one as you and I are one. Uh, you're in me and I'm in you. May they be in us also. Uh, you know, the last night of his life, one of the last prayers that he makes for the disciples is to pray about unity. And so the question would be, uh, what grade uh, would you give your church uh, or your brotherhood, your, your group of churches, the denomination you belong to, uh, in the matter of unity? And if you're honest, and you could say this probably of any denomination, any church, uh, there are times when there are problems with unity. And maybe disunity is more common and more normal uh, than unity. And if that's the case, then we are going against what Jesus prayed for fervently the last night of his life. Uh, and we're kind of ignoring that. And so you need to say, well, what are the things then that divide our church? Is it worth it for that to divide our church? If Jesus prayed that unity is one of the most important things, and if that unity is going to be a witness to the world, then isn't it important to get rid of anything that divides us? Like Paul talks about in Romans 14, sacrificing anything so that he won't make his brother stumble uh, and not letting silly things divide us. Uh, that's important as well. Um, sometimes uh, we need to think about uh, the kinds of things that we let divide us. Uh, if you think about it in terms of buying a house, um, if you went into a house and you liked the shape of the house, good construction, everything was pretty neat, but you didn't like some of the colors on the wall I didn't like the curtains hanging at the windows. That would be a good buy, right? Because all you have to do uh, is buy it and then paint or change the curtains and cosmetic fixes, and you'd have a great house. Uh, I think that sometimes in the church, the things that have divided us have been cosmetic things. Should we take one cup or many cups for the Lord's Supper? What order should we do the, the worship in? Uh, you know, what kind of version do we use of the Bible? You can make a list of a hundred things that are cosmetic things that we have let divide us. And I think that grieves God and Jesus when they see how we've let simple, unimportant things divide us. Or, and when you buy a house, there could be houses that's like, okay, I like this house overall, but you know, there are some things that we'll have to change. We'll have to knock out some walls. We'll have to add on maybe a room at the back of the house. We may need to redo the kitchen pretty completely or a bathroom. Uh, but, you know, overall, it's a good house, and so, you know, we can buy this, and so you buy it, and you do all the changes, and I think there's some things in churches that are like that, uh, where uh, there may be some practices that uh, you're not sure if they're exactly based on the Bible, or they may be uh, understood differently, 
uh, there may be uh, structural uh, things of the church leadership or church offices, uh, how things are done in general that are important things that do affect how the church functions and how people worship together and work together. But in general, uh, the core is there. You know, the structure, the bones of the house, the bones of the church are, are good. And so you say, okay, I could, I could be part of this fellowship. Uh, one friend of mine used to say, I could get to heaven from this church. And so I think, uh, and sometimes uh, we've let those kind of things divide us as well when they didn't have to, right? Uh, we could have made the changes, but maybe we just didn't want to. Maybe they were inconvenient. Uh, we didn't like them. I've heard even some people say, I know it's in the Bible, but I don't care. If you do it, I'm going to go to a different church. And, and that's a terrible attitude <laughs> because uh, God would not want his church, his people, to be divided by things that don't have to divide. But then there are some uh, houses that you might go see, and you look as you walk through, and you see cracks in the walls. You see you know, cracks running under the foundation. Uh, you see major plumbing problems or, or major you know, structural problems in the walls, and you just say, let me out of this house. <laughs> I'm not buying this house at all. And that could be the case with some churches. If you go into a church and they say, you know, the Bible is a good book, but, you know, we really don't have to pay attention to it. Or, you know, Jesus is important, but, you know, these other people are just as important. And so we're going to put them alongside of Jesus as our authorities. And, you know, Jesus is nice, but you don't have to have him to be saved. Then I would say those are dangerous churches to be a part of. And in that case, it might be justified to say, I need to find another place to worship. So, uh, you know, you alone know what your church is like, uh, and you know the kinds of problems of unity or division that you've had in your church and why. I would just challenge us all to do everything possible to remain in a church as long as that church is focused on Jesus and focused on the things that Jesus wants. Uh, if that's the case, then we can live with a lot of other things that potentially could divide us. But I think it honors the Lord uh, when we don't allow those things to divide us and we keep the unity. And that unity then is a testimony to the world that is attractive to them. Hope this has been helpful uh, thinking about some of the teachings from the Last Supper. We'll see you next time to wrap it up.